UFO whistleblower David Grush seems to have started a domino effect since Grush gave testimony to Congress in August about crashed spacecraft and, quote, non-human biologics. At least 30 other whistleblowers working for the federal government or government contractors have given testimony to the Office of the Intelligence Community Inspector General, according to sources interviewed by Public. Despite the growing number of whistleblowers, the intelligence community is still fighting disclosure, according to Public Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, Thomas A. Monhelm, said that his office has not conducted any audit, inspection, and evaluation or review of alleged UAP programs within responsibility authority of the DNI that would enable a fulsome response. Author of the public substack, Michael Schellenberger, joins us now to discuss. Michael, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So, Michael, you know, this is garnering a lot of attention. We're hearing from more and more whistleblowers. Do you think this is going to lead uh, for the government, the Pentagon in particular, to be more transparent on what they actually do know and how long they've maintained this information in private? Well, I certainly hope so. I think that's the really big question. I mean, I think what's important to point out here is that, you know, right after Grush's testimony in July, a lot of people said, you know, he's one guy, um, he's relying on secondhand information. He hasn't actually touched any uh, uh, exotic materials or spacecraft. Um, but now we have uh, reports from multiple sources, including people that have had direct contact with these programs, uh, telling us that indeed many of Grush's claims were accurate, uh, including about the, the retrieved, uh, retrieved craft around reverse engineering programs. Um, you know, I would say there's still multiple possibilities here. I uh, am agnostic myself. I do not know uh, what is going on. There is a possibility, for example, that this is a kind of social contagion, a kind of uh, effect of human unconscious that particularly impacts uh, military intelligence folks. It's not inconceivable. The thing that's so strange, though, about it is this intense level of secrecy which has actually increased in recent months. So it didn't even make it into the piece, but you know, they've been denying more freedom of information requests uh, to the federal government, to the main person that requests a guy named John Greenwald. Uh, you know that after the, during the hearing, Grush said, I'll tell you where these uh, uh, retrieved craft are at specific bases or military contractors. They would not let him have a skiff or a kind of secure compartmentalized facility. Um, and then now when we, you know, our sources tell us, and some of them were uh, in the piece, um, actually on the record, we're saying that we're seeing both the defense secretary and others start to kind of uh, close up and try to and try to basically oppose an amendment uh, proposed by Senate uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, which would require that the contractors and others with any potential crash materials return them. So, you know, if it's a social contagion, if it's something or if it's just a even if it's just a, a Defense Department weapons program, there is supposed to be congressional oversight of secret weapons programs. So the level of secrecy um, that we're seeing, I think, is really um, unusual and concerning, um, include, especially or including if it's just a social contagion. Michael, can you tell us a little bit more about how we know that there are these 30 additional whistleblowers and what, if anything, we know about who they are? where they work, what kind of security access they have, and what they might have been privy to, and potentially even the nature of what they've been disclosing? Sure, and I should say that I don't have a firm count, and really what we're able to say are dozens. Uh, these are all individuals in the government that are, or, or working for military contractors. These are all people in the know. Um, I actually had more sources on this uh, story than I had on my previous uh, story. So I feel very confident um, that that these people that are telling me this uh, believe that they're telling me the truth. Um, I also, I don't think it's that surprising really that there's this many people if you consider that this has been an issue that's been going on for 75 years and people have not uh, had a place to go to share this information. And so sometimes when people ask me, there's a lot of people that rightly wonder, why is this happening now? And maybe they're using this to cover up the Hunter Biden laptop or something like that, which is obviously an issue I am also concerned with. Um, part of the answer is this internal process within the federal government where they've established these special protections for whistleblowers to come forward on this issue. Um, as you know, the 
inspector general is the office in different federal uh, agencies that is a place where you are supposed to be able to go and not fear reprisal. The reality is often there is uh, consequences for people going to those departments, but nonetheless, it's supposed to be uh, confidential. It's supposed to be secure. Uh, you know, Sheriff Michael, when he read the the response from the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, a guy named Thomas A. Monheim, it was a very strange he, it, letter because he sent it to one of the Congress people that had asked about this, uh, about the whistleblowers. And Monheim said, yeah, there's no audit or uh, evaluation, making it sound like they weren't looking into this. Well, of course, we know, um, I'm 100% sure that they are looking into this. I have very strong evidence that they are looking into this. But they let he left off his letter, the word investigation. So he never said he wasn't doing an investigation. Well, that's not just a semantic point. Investigation is a whole department of his um, special office. So so you see that, I mean, that's kind of, they're playing some games there. And, and you have to kind of ask, you know, what is it that they're covering up? Now, sometimes I think people say, well, if it's a weapons program, they have to keep it secret. Maybe that's the case. But again, first of all, there's supposed to be congressional oversight over secret weapons programs. And second of all, sometimes the government actually hypes weapon programs that we don't have. The most famous example of this is Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program or the Strategic Defense Initiative. They exaggerated the ability of that program to protect the United States from from nuclear weapons coming in from Russia or other countries. So I do think there's a lot of unanswered questions still. I do think that, you know, um, America does a pretty good job with checks and balances, and we do have a process in place. We have multiple places that these guys can go. It's not just, as we mentioned in the piece, that they can go to the inspector general, but they can also go directly to Congress. And any whistleblowers listening to this should know this. You can go right to Congress. And then they can also go to this DOD office, although many of the people I spoke with did not have a lot of confidence that they were doing a serious investigation. Michael, I want to go back to something you mentioned in terms of some of the critics saying, well, perhaps these are some types of, of type of weapons programs, advanced technology. I mean, right now we're sort of in this hypersonics race with China and Russia in terms of missiles, but also aircraft that can travel with Mach 5 and above. Uh, some of the critics are saying, well, we don't want our adversaries knowing that the United States is working on this type of technology. Uh, some have argued maybe we're working on anti-gravitational uh, type of craft. We don't want individuals to know that we have that technology. What would you say to those critics who've tried to point those things out to sort of dispel uh, some of the whistleblowers and to prevent others from potentially coming out? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really legitimate argument because there there have been efforts in the past, and we note in the piece, a very famous incident where the Air Force Intelligence Service actually spread disinformation to UFO enthusiasts, um, ostensibly to cover up uh, stealth uh, weapons programs. There's also some evidence this may have occurred around the development of drones. Um, that particular case was very irresponsible because they actually drove a person, or at least they contributed to a person having a mental breakdown in convincing him that he was somehow uncovering a, uh, an alien invasion. It's a crazy episode uh, depicted in this terrific book and movie called Mirage Men. Uh, that sort of activities are not supposed to be engaged in by U.S. intelligence anymore against the American people. They're not supposed to be engaged in that sort of deception or disinformation. I think there is experimentation with different forms of propul propulsion. You know, as somebody that works on energy and climate change, obviously, if we're developing forms of propulsion that are not from combustion and do not create uh, greenhouse gases, that's massive. That would be a technology that you would want to spill out of the DOD eventually into the world because that would be a way to produce, um, that would be a way to tr have transportation, obviously, without uh, creating uh, combustion or, or, or carbon, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So obviously that would be a huge event. I mean, just a radical event like the invention of nuclear. I have not gotten the sense from anybody I've spoken to that we have uh, mastered those propulsion techniques, although there was some, I did speak to uh, one person that did see uh, one of these famous uh, triangles operating on a different form of propulsion. This person did not know whether it was a US government uh, created craft or whether it was from some other intelligence. Um, so a lot of mysteries await. But yeah, I think that's a huge question, one that 
we have a lot more questions about than answers. Mm -hmm. Michael, you mentioned that there were several avenues for whistleblowers to come forward uh, and disclose to one of those obviously could potentially just be directly to the media. What's your understanding of the disincentives for, let's say, the 30 or so people that you identified in your article who have already um, revealed themselves to have information about um, alien life, to not just come forward and tell the public directly if that information is being kept quiet by the government? Yeah, I mean, obviously, so we have seen now one case of it with David Grush, um, you know, a person who did decide to go to the public with this and went through, you know, I think what's interesting, I've dealt with now a fair number of whistleblowers. Grush uh, really followed all of the rules very carefully. Uh, not everybody is as careful about that. Um, I think many people try to, but there is some complexity there. And you're also trying to protect your place at work. But certainly going public is the end of your career uh, for, I think, these people, um, you know, including Grush. And so they don't want to do that. I met with uh, several people now, including in person, and I can tell you that their fear was genuine and that uh, I think it's very hard to fake the kinds of fear that I experienced. Um, I think most of us know that most most actors are pretty terrible at their jobs. Most acting is bad. It's hard to find lay people who are able to fake those kinds of emotions. So something scared them. We also did a report earlier, uh, or back in the summer, actually, um, on the same day that Grush testified in July, about a very a long history of people that report seeing UFOs or being whistleblowers on UFOs reporting death threats or other kinds of threats, including threats to have their security clearances revoked or their jobs lost or just the, the stigmatization and ostracization that came from people being ridiculed or uh, being uh, accused of being crazy or participating in a hoax. So I think there's a huge amount of fear. Um, people that um, I spoke to, I mean, it was absolutely off the record, deep background. Uh, I've taken great care never to refer to people's you know, gender identity or what agency they're at or whether they're with a contract or even with the government. And obviously, I've been trying to be as um, specific as I can to provide the details that I think are in the public's interest, but also to protect these folks who are absolutely terrified. And these are people that are ostensibly under these whistleblower protections. I mean, Michael, I think for most of our viewers, that fear that you speak of, of career suicide, considering how powerful the government is, is, is palpable for most people watching. But what, I want to get a little more into the weeds here, Mike, in terms of what these new whistleblowers are claiming and or confirming. You're right. Testimony has included both firsthand and secondhand reports of crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs by U.S., Russian, and Chinese governments. The testing of materials obtained from retrieved craft, active and ongoing government disinformation operations, kinetic military action with UAPs, contact and collaboration with non-human intelligence, and the successful reverse engineering of a triangular shape craft with unconventional propulsion. And, and that sort of gets to, Mike, what, what I was saying earlier about the type of technology that we may or may not be having. Like you just said, if we have this technology, where in the world did we get it from, even if we haven't mastered it yet? Yeah, well, so I laugh a little bit when you read that paragraph, and I hesitated <laughs> to include it in the article because it's so outrageous and absurd. And you, as any independent thinker, you have to assume the chances are as good of that being not the, any of those things not being the case mm -hmm. as being the case. And so what you're dealing with here and what we're reporting and not making judgment on is that this is what people are telling us. And it's not, these are not, you know, people in psychotic states. Uh, these are people in very high positions of authority, in positions to know, well confirmed, uh, don't appear to have any uh, interest in sharing this, which kind of leaves you with one possibility that it's, like I mentioned, it's a social contagion, it's psychogenic in some peculiar way that affects a certain group of people um, you know, I could I'm going to write an article making kind of laying out the best case for the a psychogenic explanation for this. Obviously, again, the biggest problem with that explanation is just the government secrecy, because if it were just uh, all in people's heads, I, you could say, or if it were just some sort of a social phenomenon, 
the way you get rid of that is to have greater openness and transparency and you allow people to talk about it and you are you open up the doors to the to the bases and the defense contractors and you kind of go look there's nothing to see here or you might say sure of course we've got secret um programs weapons programs going on and, and everybody knows that and and there's just things that we we can't reveal to you because it's better for the public not to know um those aren't the behaviors that we're seeing and mm -hmm. that's i think what's so odd about this um but yeah i mean look i think what's so weird about the the experience and what you laugh about it is that it seems like the stories that we're hearing are some of the are some of the wildest kind of conspiracy theories that we've been hearing for a really long time and you don't know what to make of it i think it's important i, I report on it because i think people have a right to know but uh it's hard not to kind of uh discount it pretty significantly obviously until we get to the bottom of this but yeah. i did also I'll, I'll end by just noting that i quoted I think maybe the most important skeptic on this issue, or at least one of the most prominent skeptics, a person named Mick West. And he said, we need to get to the bottom of this. So there's a, so ostensibly a big divide between UFO believers and UFO skeptics. But I do think that what you find is actually that the UFO skeptics want to get to the bottom of this. They want transparency. They want disclosure just as much as the believers do. Michael yeah. Schellenberger, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Michael.